If you think black business owners collaborating for success is new, then you have not heard about the National Negro Business League formed in 1900. In 1899, black men and women were hard at work organizing the National Negro Business League in 36 states and territories as far west as California, as south as Texas, and as north as Maine. Most did business in the South, where Jim Crow was rampant. Another dilemma for successful black business persons, north, south, east, and west, was the constant threat of destruction of their homes and businesses by resentful whites seeing their success. This threat and reality were byproducts of doing businesses while black in America. What makes history real and exciting is moving from the facts and numbers to the flesh and vision of those making history. And every state represented at the National Negro Business League meeting in Boston in 1900 had heroes and sheroes aplenty. The League was the inspiration of Booker T. Washington, and in the spirit of inclusion, he acknowledged that women were just as professional and driven and committed to entrepreneurial success as men. This show will highlight the women in attendance at the first National Negro Business League. Pictured in the League booklet of the 1900 convention was Mrs. Is Isabel R. Beale of West Newton, Massachusetts, Mrs. A.J. Thorne from Morgan City, Louisiana, Mrs. A.A. A. Kasnar of Boston, Massachusetts, and Mrs. Alberta Moore Smith of Chicago, Illinois. There appears to have been 17 women in attendance at the meeting. One I will introduce later was a remarkable 15-year-old girl. Business women represented there included five dressmakers and tailors, four hair, skin, and nail practitioners, a hotel owner, and several others whose professions were not identified. Most were also prominent club women. The Black Women's Club Movement was a self-help, charitable, race-uplifting, education, employment, civil rights, and advocacy clubs that were established by black women. Alberta Moore Smith of Chicago, on the second morning of the meeting, made history by being given the honor of being the first black woman to present at a National Negro Business League convention. Mrs. Moore Smith was clearly a feminist of the first order. She is listed as president of the CWB Club which likely stood for Colored Women in Business Club of Chicago. This is part of her remarks. To the minds of many, there is a new woman, but in actuality, she does not exist. Theories have been put forth to show that she is new, but the only satisfactory evidence or conclusion agreed upon is that she is simply progressing her natural tendencies having not changed one iota. Ever since the days of Cleopatra, who skilled in music and conversed in art, was acknowledged to possess superior intellectual talents, women have been aggressive in their capabilities to be recognized. Early in the 17th century, there arose a class of women who won great celebrity by a display of knowledge upon subjects other than how, to, how babies cut teeth. Prominent among them were Madame de Maintenon and Hannah Moore, the greatest women educators and writers of their age, and the highest types of womanhood, morally, spiritually, and intellectually, of any century. From that time on, many women have assiduously sought the blessings of higher education and a more accurate knowledge of all aspects of business. They have surmounted many obstacles, and in this, the close of the 19th century, 
many links have been forged by them in the chain of, quote, progress. The spirit of advancement is a legacy that has been handed down to us by many brave women who, in the face of opposition and persecution from many sources, gave their lives and talents to the cause. The labor of hundreds of years is bearing fruit. Women are gradually reaching the summit of higher education and therefore of of greater usefulness in the business world. Quote, As a nation grows, its people are destined to feel the influence and its enlightenment developed. End quote. The influence of progress has taken such a firm hold upon the American nation within the last 30 years that it is as impossible for women to remain in obscurity as it is for men to refrain from progressing. The practical businesswoman is the outcome, the sole product of America. In no other country does she enjoy the same privileges, liberty, independence and freedom as she does here if she be true to her calling she does not abuse these privileges on the contrary with all the knowledge gained from a free and unconventional education she takes her place in society as a faithful friend in the business world as a judicious counselor and in the home as a loving wife and queen Wow, words just as poignant today. Her speech goes on for some time with a few scathing remarks about men. I only wonder the reactions of the predominantly male audience. The League had hundreds of male members, and we know that black women were extremely active in business. They did not generally enjoy the same levels of income seen by black men. They primarily had service businesses in cooking, cleaning, making clothing, or hair, hands, and foot care. Women represented 13 states, including Alabama, Georgia, Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Rhode Island, Texas, and Virginia. One of the most outstanding women to address the assembly was Mrs. Alice A. Tolliver Kasnaw. Alice Tolliver was probably born prior to 1873 in Massachusetts. Little is known of her childhood or the circumstances of her birth. She married Elmer E. Kasnaw, a barber, in 1887 and had a daughter, Pearl, in 1892. What we do know is that she became an acclaimed professional seamstress, an outstanding member of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which held its first national conference in Boston in 1895. Five years later, she was a recognized businesswoman at the first national conference of the National Negro Business League, also in Boston. In 1895, Mrs. Kasnaw presented the speech, Morals and Manners, at the Women's Era Club. She was also an associate member of the Massachusetts branch of the Niagara Movement in 1907 with W.E.B. Du Bois. Kasnaw's Guide for Artistic Dress Cutting and Making was published in 1895 which was a remarkable 72-page booklet on dressmaking and patterns. It was one of the ten titles by black women authors available in the reception room of the National Conference of Colored Women in 1895. Her work was also featured on the literature table at the New England Hospital for Women and Children. During World War I, she served on the executive committee of the Soldiers' Comfort Unit in Boston, a women's group that provided supports for black soldiers stationed in or near Boston. In 1925, she was elected president of the League of Women for Community Service. This is an excerpt of what Alice Kasnaw 
shared at the league meeting. Her topic was dressmaking, but her message was far more encompassing. When we remember that at the beginning of the present century, there was not a mile of railroad, and today in the United States alone, there are more than 185,000 miles, a third of the mileage of the entire world, that no steamboat existed in the world 100 years ago, that the newspaper had hardly started, that the streetcar was unknown, that the telegraph was undreamed of, that garments were spun by hand, that to go from New York to Philadelphia meant two days by the swiftest stage. Today, it can be done in two hours. That there were only five large cities in America, that Chicago was unheard of in 1800. When we view all these and many other marvels that have been wrought in 100 years, we are obliged to admit that somebody has done a vast amount of thinking and planning and working. The question now arises, how shall we not only as individuals but as a people gain a foothold in the great business and industrial life of this country and in any way compete with the men and women whose ancestors have been merchants for centuries my answer would be take an account of stock in hand learn to do some one thing well find a need for it and supply that need if there is no market for your wares in the community in which you live find a place that needs you that needs just the talent that god has given you and when you have found it fill it the world today is just as much in need of faithful loyal workers as ever it was success is sure to crown the life of any one who possesses an average intellect a high ideal a disposition to work who is ready to sacrifice if necessary and is willing to bear needful trials sometime somewhere god gives to every one a chance to win victory in these days of struggle and toil of success and failure of competition and strife we shall not be able to meet the requirements of the times unless we begin to arrange some definite plans of development along business and commercial lines work is the birthright of the human family there is dignity in labor there is also a law of equity men get what they deserve we reap what we sow things do not develop themselves in this world they are developed it is the active not the passive voice in such matters there is an endless chain of efficient natural causes running through life nothing comes from nothing multiply even millions by naught and a naught is the product let us be practical a single practical life has more than once changed the aspect of the civilized world genuine success is not a sudden outburst of what men call genius but rather the result of continual patient commonplace talk there is no royal road to success god is immensely wealthy and has designed that man should be rich so he stored the earth underneath with unaccountable treasures of gold silver iron lead and gems and vast reservoirs of fuel and stocked with the soil with great wealth producing power and crowded the seas and air with immense material for making it we know that these blessings are not intended for any one class of people it is for us to take advantage of the productions of the earth or in the natural order of things god will take away our birthright and give it to another who is more worthy than we education is necessary to obtain wealth coal 
electricity, sunlight, and water have been in the earth since man was created, but ignorance got no wealth out of them, nor ever would. Men educated to desire only the bare necessities of existence never make a market for anything but those necessities educate them to appreciate and desire other things and you increase both their wealth and the wealth of the world if there is one thing we need more than another it is business courage this was brought very forcibly to me about two years ago a young woman from finchburg massachusetts wrote me stating that the librarian in her city had called her attention to a new book on dressmaking which had come in and knowing that she was interested in that work recommended it as the easiest and most complete method she had ever seen the young woman secured the book and read it from beginning to ending, testing its merits, and wrote me a most flattering letter telling how much she had gained from it, but said that there were two or three lessons she would like to see demonstrated, as she intended following dressmaking as a means of gaining a livelihood, and I, if I would make an appointment, she would come to Boston and take the necessary instructions. Of course, everyone is delighted to receive a letter commending his or her work and i am no exception after some correspondence the time was set and it was arranged that the young woman would come i had not signed my letters to her quote, colored but i knew that she did not expect to see a colored woman in the course of fifteen years in business i have faced some of the most critical people and have been placed at times under extremely trying circumstances but this particular time seemed to be a weak moment in my experience for all my fortitude forsook me and right on my own ground i hesitated actually feared to face a woman who had written me commending my work and saying that she was willing to pay a fair price for instruction which experience had fitted me to give i assure you that mine was a most uncomfortable feeling i stood outside the door of the room into which she had been shown and pictured her look of surprise when she should see me how she would catch her breath and stammer and ask if i was a person with whom she had been corresponding until i stamped my foot and for the first time in my life i sincerely wished it had been otherwise finally i gave myself a good shaking mentally and began to reason in this way if you allow this circumstance to master you you are not worthy of success and this would be the beginning of your failure your power as one of the workers of the world will have lessened because you have lost confidence in yourself that which you have believed yourself capable of doing will become a drag on your hands you will never be able to teach successfully another pupil you may as well take your book off the market and close your sewing room door until you have cultivated business courage and then i gathered inspiration from the thought of booker t washington's efficient dairyman whose color faded into butter when it was found that he made his employer two or three cents more on the pound than butter made by other dairymen and in that moment all fear left me and i entered that room a woman not particularly a colored woman the young girl acted just as i had supposed she would but it had no effect on me because i had already found my fought my battle from within and was prepared to talk so fast about the work and what she wanted to know that she was soon relieved of all embarrassment i sold a friend from scotland who was with her a book gave her several lessons 
have her letter of recommendation, and best of all, have the strength which comes from a conquest over self. In closing, let me say that wherever a man or woman has put conscientious, skillful labor into any business, he or she, regardless of color, has attained a degree of success equal to that of any other person under like circumstances. There is an incentive for any one to try, for although the businessman may not have reached the zenith of success, his condition is certainly superior to the one who sits still and waits for something to turn up. All the promises in this life or in the life hereafter are to him that overcomes. To the victor belongs the spoils. A stout heart, a dauntless will, and a pure spirit are invincible everywhere. Nature yields her hidden secrets to him who dares seek them. Of her comes wealth, of her comes success, but not to the faint-hearted. Fear keeps many a man poor. Noble manhood and noble womanhood grow from resolute, determined spirits that take their life's challenges to be what indeed they are, the need for preparation for far more responsible and ennobling duties. With these words, the assembly was adjourned at 8 o'clock p.m. She gave every member something to sleep on. As promised, I will introduce you to Little Miss Sunshine. In the records of the Leeds List of Delegates publication, I came across a most curious notation. L. Susie Jeter, an agent for several companies in Newport, Rhode Island. They also wrote, quote, a little girl of 15 years of age, end quote, is agent for several papers, a soap company, and a silverware company. Who was this extremely young woman? I found an online source that I'd been identified Miss Lillian Susie Fitz Jeter, who was the fourth child of Reverend and Mrs. H. N. Jeter. She was born in 1885. She possessed a mind of much intellect, it is written. She has written a book entitled Wilberforce Academy, which she has dedicated to her mother, Mrs. Thomasina H. Jeter. She is an agent for the Ladies' Home Journal, the Saturday Evening Post, the Monarch Book Company of Philadelphia, the Royal Manufacturing Company of Detroit, Michigan, with the Larkin Soap Company of Buffalo, New York, the Bicycle Gum Company of Chicago, and McCall Magazine of New York. 